Hello. I'm delighted to be here. And yes, it's true, I'm going to talk about donuts. But let's get the health warning out of the way at the beginning. Not these, OK? Don't eat these. They're actually not very nice. They look promising, but they don't leave you feeling good. No, I'm not going to talk about those. What I want you to imagine is the picture of a donut, the image, the idea of a donut. You see, because pictures are powerful. They can be paradigm changing. So yeah, donuts and pictures. Pictures are very powerful. We have known this for a long time. Copernicus knew this. Back in the 1500s, Copernicus was watching the movement of the planets. And he knew that Ptolemy over here, who had put Earth unmoving at the center of the known universe, he knew that Ptolemy had it all wrong. But Copernicus waited until he was on his deathbed before he dared to publish his own alternative picture because he knew that by putting the sun at the center of the universe, he was questioning church power, upending papal authority, and challenging man's place in the universe. So it's extraordinary what havoc a few concentric circles can unleash. So I want to introduce you to a new picture, a paradigm for our times. And yes, it looks a little bit like a donut. In fact, it's the one donut that will turn out to be good for you. So let me tell you about this. In the middle, in the hole in this donut, is a place where people are falling short on life's essentials. People don't have the food, healthcare, housing, education, income, gender equality, political voice that every person has a claim to in order to lead a life of dignity and opportunity and community. And these 12 social issues, I've crowdsourced them from the world's governments. They are from the Sustainable Development Goals. So they're the most contemporary statement of what has been agreed internationally is the claim of every human being. Of course, they're founded in human rights. So we want to get everybody out of that hole in the middle. But we can't overshoot the outside crust of this donut because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary living planet that we begin to kick it out of kilter. We cause climate breakdown, acidify the oceans, air pollution, biodiversity loss. And these are the nine planetary boundaries drawn up in this sweet city of Stockholm by the Earth system scientists who said, what is it about the last 11,000 years that has been so extraordinarily stable and benevolent for humanity? These nine processes have made us have such a home sweet home on planet Earth. We'd be crazy to kick ourselves out of this space. So our challenge, in the simplest of terms, is to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. And I believe this is our generational challenge. This is, this is our century's task. Can we put ourselves on track to do that? I think it's a compass for the 21st century. But if it's a compass, you want to know where the needles are pointing. Let me show you. It's not a pretty picture, but this is the reality we have today. On the social side, on every single dimension, there are millions, indeed billions of people falling short on life's essentials. 11% of people in the world don't have enough food to eat. One person in three doesn't have access to what we would call a toilet. On all of these dimensions, people fall short. And yet, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate breakdown, on fertilizer use with nitrogen and phosphorus, massive biodiversity loss, land conversion. We don't even know where we are on air and chemical pollution. So this is the state of us and our home at the beginning of the 21st century. Can we turn this around? Our children's children will not remember us for Trump or even where I come for Brexit. They'll remember us for this as the generation that could have acted to turn it around. The question is, will we? Will we be that generation? And so I invite you to imagine your own life in relation to this picture. How does the way that I shop, eat, travel, vote, bank, invest, divest, protest, volunteer, how do all these ways that I live affect humanity's ability 
to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet? What if, what if city designers were designing cities using this idea? Well, in fact, in this very city, that's what's happening. I was contacted by a group called Urban Minds. They said, hey, we're developing a new suburb of Stockholm. Let me try, Norrkimling, <laughs> if that works for you. And they said, we're using your donut. And we're asking, how can we develop a new suburb which meets the needs of all within the means of the planet? So city designers are beginning to think like this. But here's a question. What if every company in the world, when it sat down to draw up its corporate strategy, what if they sat down around this table and asked themselves, is our business making profit by pushing humanity below the social foundation and actually pushing us beyond the environmental ceiling here? Or is the core of our business actually helping bring humanity into this space? Well, I've asked that question with many companies over the last five years, and I've been fascinated by the range of answers that I've had. And in fact, I've turned it into something I call the corporate to-do list. Let me show you this corporate to-do list. So, five responses from companies. The first response is the oldest. It's do nothing. The business of business is business, and what we're doing is nearly legal, and we're just going to carry right on until somebody changes the law. Well, this doesn't work anymore. And even companies trying to work like this already are feeling the repercussions in their supply chains, in protest back from consumers. This is so last century. So then there's the next step up. Okay, we'll, we'll do what pays. If you tell me that I'm going to save money by cutting my carbon and actually this will help my profits and my bottom line, I'll do that. If, if getting green, a green label or green branding on my product will help with a niche market, I'll do that. It's a first step but it's too much a little first step and it's too incremental. We're never going to get there if we only do what already pays. So then the next step up is beginning to get more ambitious. I'll do my fair share. And we see, you know, countries are saying we're going to cut our carbon emissions by 20% in 20 years. Well, we'll cut our carbon emissions by 20% in 20 years. It's a good effort because it's trying to be in line with science. The trouble with fair shares is that if any, anyone who's ever been to a restaurant with friends and everyone chips in what they think is their fair share of the bill. If you're left holding the bill, it almost never adds up. And that's what we see at the climate negotiations. Each country saying, you haven't paid your fair share. I'm not doing my fair share till you do your fair share. But also fair shares can quickly flip around from what's my fair share to contribute to what's my fair share to take. I can't tell you the number of major companies, particularly resource companies, oil companies, to say, hmm, this global carbon budget. How much of that is mine, right? I want to take my fair share. Well, none of it is yours because we cannot afford to give away the right to pollute anymore. We have to transform the mindset and go higher up this level of aspiration. So the fourth one, we're going to do mission zero. Fantastic, we're going to have zero carbon emissions in our supply chain or zero wastewater. It's truly beginning to be transformative. But if you can do zero harm, why not? break through that ceiling of imagination and actually do good. Be generous, be generative by design. Now, with generous, I don't mean giving eggs to your neighbor. What I mean is creating a value, a product that actually gives back to the living world from which it has drawn, which gives back to the community on which it depends. It's part of the cycles of give and take of life. And to be generative by design, I think companies need to have two principles at the heart of what they do. The first is to be distributive by design, in which a company in which value that's created is shared far more equitably with all of those who help to create it. Think of those down the supply chain or the employees in relation to the shareholders. So far more equitable design of value that's shared. But also, we need to be regenerative by design. And through the middle of this picture, you can see the degenerative linear 20th century economy in which we take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, and then throw it away. And that cuts against the cycles of the living world. It runs down the planet and pushes us over planetary boundaries. So we need to bend those arrows around, allowing nature to regenerate herself as she has done for 3.8 billion years. But even here, where the materials we make from a clicker to a candlestick, to reuse and recycle and refurbish these materials so that things are never used up, but always used again and again. And of course, we need to do these together. It's not a choice between, between being regenerative and distributive, but bringing them together. And I want to give you a little example. Hang on a moment. 
It's extraordinary what you can find down the back of the sofa. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah, I see. So here's a piece of old hose pipe down the back of the sofa. So the 20th century model of industry, we take materials and you stuff them in the tube and then you squish them down, you make them into stuff, and then the waste is spewed out. We can't do this anymore. We know that we need to curve this loop around and make a circular system. Now, let me imagine that was a mobile phone company. So they said, yeah, bring us our phones back and we'll reuse them and we'll turn them back into mobile phones. Could I give this to you, sir, please? Just to hold this circular. There we are, you see. So there's, we've got a nice little circular loop and then maybe there's a, there's a, a, a laptop company. That, don't worry, there's not too many more of those coming out from behind the sofa. <laughs> and, and then we're going to, right, the spewing out, we've got to bend this loop around and we've got to turn it into a circular economy. Could I give that to you? There we are. Now, I would see we've got two little circular loops going here. We've got the beginnings of a circular economy, a com a com companies doing what they can on their own. But now I invite everybody in this room who's ever worked for any company that makes something, just, just make a little loop. Imagine that you're making a little circular loop. Oh, yes, we've got the beginnings of a circular economy. Fat, you look fantastic. Oh, my goodness. So many, right, we've got the beginning of a circular economy. Now, I have to tell you, you look, you look cute. <laughs> but... Nature would laugh at us. You can come down there. Nature would laugh at us because nature doesn't turn the parrot into a parrot and a, and a daffodil into a daffodil and the shark into a shark. Nature breaks it all down and has an ecosystem that is integrated. So nature is a little bit more like this, right? This is nature's circular economy. And this is the actual circular economy we need to get to. Not segmented little circles, but an, an ecosystem of industry, and this is the exciting opportunity of the circular economy. How do we create an ecosystem of resource use where waste from one process becomes the food for the next? I believe if we're gonna get there, we need to be open source. We need to have modular design. We need to have open standards and open material use so that people can connect across industries and bring these together and create the true circular economy that is also distributive by design. I know we're on our way there, but we've got a bit of a, a psychological drama that we're going to face before we get there. I think it's a psychological drama between two mindsets, the one that's emerging in the 21st century and the one that's still left with us from the 20th. So here's what I hear when I meet 21st century entrepreneurs, city designers, people who have that sparkle in their eyes and who are creating this regenerative and distributive economy. The question that's always driving them how many benefits can we layer into the way we design this? How could we make this regenerative? How could we include the community? How much more can we layer in? That's where the excitement of entrepreneurship comes from. But the question, on the other hand, when they go to those who are financing them, it's a very different question. It's still stuck in the 20th century. How much financial value can we extract from this? And I think we are going to see a psychological drama between these two mindsets. In fact, it's already happening. Many of the world's most innovative companies experience it every day because they're over here asking this generative question, but they're still caught with this last century question. What is it that divides companies that some can move into this new space and some are held back here? I think it's five principles of company design. How a company has a purpose. What is the purpose of the company? Is it a living purpose or a financial one? How is it governed? How is it networked? whether in that ecosystem or through its supply chains. How is it owned? And therefore, ultimately, how is it financed? Because these questions of company design have so much shape and determination over whether or not this question can truly be unleashed and whether indeed we can create regenerative and distributive economies by design. What I see at the moment are some companies struggling in a really schizophrenic moment because they've changed their purpose. We want to be over here with our purpose. We've got this fantastic vision for where we're going, but they're pulled back because their governance and networks and ownership and finance are still stuck in this 20th century model. And the question is, how can we align all of that structure to enable the 21st century design to come through, to enable products and cities and processes to be regenerative and distributive by design. Because if we can unlock that, the design of finance, the ownership of enterprise, the governance and the networks, and put living purpose at the heart of enterprise, then we will truly be on the path to a distributive and regenerative economy. And so I'm going to come back to this donut 
our 21st century compass, our moment in time, and our choice as to whether we live with this or we start to turn this around and create the enterprises that can bring us into this space. And if you find this com image compelling, I'm delighted. But as with most powerful images, it's a, a creation of more than one mind, indeed a partnership. I drew the inside of this circle. But I would now, I'm going to practice my best Swedish accent to introduce to you the person who drew the outside of the circle, Professor Johan Rockström. Well, thank you, Kate. And I'll, you know, I was sitting here and realizing I, I, I feel like saying something I shouldn't be saying in public at all. And I'm glad my wife is not here. But I think you and I would make a perfect couple. <laughs> I mean, intellectually speaking. And, and it is actually true. I mean, you started with Copernicus. And um, I think it's really important to recognize that uh, 30 years of like Isaac Newton once pointed out, standing on the shoulders of giants is what takes us to the next incremental step of knowledge generation. And I would strongly argue that what, what Kate has presented for us here today is, is, I would call it, scientific inevitability. It is the pathway forward. When we presented the Planet Boundary Science in 2009, it was really standing on the shoulder of giants. 30 years of Earth system science advancements building on Professor John Schellenhuber's recognition that we've reached a saturation point on planet Earth, the 30 years of science showing that we've entered a whole new geological epoch, we're in the Anthropocene, we're now the largest drivers of change on planet Earth, or as Professor Will Steffen in Australia points out, that we're now hitting the ceiling of the hardwired biophysical processes that regulate the stability of the Earth system. So that gives us the biophysical safe operating space. And in comes Kate Roworth, and of course, if there's a biophysical ceiling, there must be a social floor. I would even argue today that if you take this science seriously, it actually leads to the Paris Climate Agreement. It leads to the Sustainable Development Goals. Political leadership in the world, despite its inertia, is listening. And that leads to donut economics. It leads to circular economic thinking. It leads to the necessity and inevitability of a complete reframing of our business models, of our societal frameworks. And this is not only a necessity. And that's what is so exciting with your book as well. It's also a grand opportunity of changing the business models, of changing the pathways towards innovation, transformation, and therefore prosperity and success. And I think that is really what this conversation here today is about. So my question back to you, being so inspired by only, not only this talk, but all the work that I've been following over the years is, and I now have to teach you a little Swedish expression. We say here in Swedish, börja på lätten trilla ner. <laughs> the question that means, are you getting traction? Oh. Is things happening? Are you starting to see this come across? Are you seeing a mind shift? I mean, you're traveling around the world, engaging with business leadership, with civil society, with political leadership. Are you seeing things happening or are you still preaching out in the space? So my principle is to go where the energy is. I, I don't knock on anybody's door. I wait until they knock on my door. And I wrote the book I've written uh, specifically, primarily for the economic students of today who, like me 25 years ago, passionately want to help change the world and want to learn the mother tongue of public policy, but are still being taught last century's ideas. Mm. So I wrote for the long view. What's really struck me, though, is that people who are dealing with the present are coming and knocking on the door. Politicians from different parties in different countries have said, we want to talk to you about this. We're looking for new words and a new language to talk about a new vision. Business leaders, some of whom are in this room, we want to use this idea. We're already using this idea in our business. This is what we're doing. You've drawn the picture. It's urban designers who are saying we're creating new cities from South Africa to Stockholm. How can we use these ideas? So yes, there is traction. What it shows to me is there is such a hunger for new ideas, for positive ideas that show us the world we want to create and that actually unleash people's energy. So yes, there is traction. I mean, we. It could be faster, it could be more, mm. and of course there's resistance, 
right? There's resistance from the mainstream, from the old school, from the financial centers who see this as taking away from their financial power. But I think there is a groundswell of movement. Mm. Yeah, and I think you and I can give a, a little testimonial here as well. I mean, both, both Kate and I sit in something really exciting, which is um, on the advisory group to reconfigure the basic first year in all curriculum at uh, Stockholm Business School, Handelshögskolan. Is anyone here from Handelshögskolan, yes. by the way? Yes! Look at that. Here we have the master of the whole program. Wonderful. And it's so fantastic to be in the lecture hall with all the students. You, you were there today. I was there this exactly. morning. And it's a full room, and everyone is so enthusiastic, and the students are hungry. It really is, like, like Tina points out, it's, it's, uh, you, know, you sense that there is not only a hunger, but also the sense that we're talking about responsibility, yes, but also opportunity. That this is the pathway, that the entry point of sustainability in a donut framework is the pathway to success as a business leader or as an economist or as a societal a member of society. And how was your talk today? It was fantastic. It was fascinating. There were some really keen students who were just le like, I, how do I get more of this? How do I get more of this? And there were some saying, but I like the mathematics of the old system. And there were some professors who I didn't quite catch their eye. But, uh, they, but, but it's, it's about paradigm change. It's about bringing new ideas in the mm. room and being honest that things are moving. And how do we, how do we make shift from the old to the new ideas? It's, and it's very exciting time if you feel like you can be part of the change and you embrace it and, and think this is a huge opportunity to mm. redesign systems. Yeah, and I remember you making that point, which I totally support, that you know, if we do not invest in basically reconfiguring the minds of the next generation of economists, then we're very unlikely yeah. to succeed with a transformation towards a prosperous, sustainable future on Earth. So that is something really critical. Now, I'm wondering if we could also explore together, we have three and a half minutes left, how can we accelerate and amplify this journey? I mean, what can we do together to really go to scale with this whole new paradigm? Because I'm, I'm quite sure that we in this room are you know, largely a collective of engaged business leaders, academics, you know, from all walks of life, who really believe yeah. that this is a path towards success in the future. What, what could we do? What could we, what would in your mind be kind of a creative, innovative way of, of ramping up even further? I mean, we cannot rely on Kate Raworth giving lectures everywhere in the world and uh, solve things for us. What can we do together? And even that wouldn't, because if you can show a picture, Great, it, it can be paradigm changing, it is inspirational, but, but then follow it up with an example. Show me, show yeah. me someone who's doing this. So I showed you the Swedish, uh, the, the urban designers. I heard a little murmur in the room, right? I could hear it, you're like, oh, oh, this isn't just an idea, this is actually happening. It changes us when we see somebody doing it. Mm. Because then we want to say, well, how is it you're doing that? What is it about the way you're structured or financed or purposed that you can do that? So for me, it's bringing out those examples and then understanding how, th how are the structures around these people different that allows them to do this and how we expand that design. That's, to me, the excitement of redesigning the opportunity. Mm -hmm. How do you redesign government policy? How do you redesign long-term investment? How do you redesign the heck of a financial system to bring it into line with what we know we fundamentally have to be for? So at last, economics, I believe, now has a purpose. It's to overcome this, to reverse this. The purpose of the economy is to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. How do we redesign the systems to help us go in that direction? And once you have a clear purpose, so much energy follows. Mm. And I mean, I can just share as a, as a little piece of update. I mean, we work very actively right as we speak with uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development who are operationalizing this concept, not as a corporate social responsibility, responsibility, but as a business strategy. We work with WeMIM Business, which, as you may recall, was the network gathering business in the run-up to Paris. That was when the private sector really stepped up and said, we want a really ambitious science-based climate agreement. We got it. And now WeMIM Business wants to go planetary boundaries. Why? Because they want science-based targets scaled down to different individual businesses as a pathway to be more innovative and more competitive. We had the World Economic Forum at the big UNGA week, the Climate Summit and General Assembly, just two weeks back in New York. And even Klaus Schwab, 
if I may say so, you know, the leader of the World Economic Forum, propagating the fourth industrial revolution, saying that yes, it has to be domesticated, he didn't use that word, it has to occur within planetary boundaries and a safe operating space. And increasing the recognition that once you're inside that space, it has to be an equity-based strategy for prosperity. So I think we are seeing some things moving in, in the right direction. So what is your next step? I want to work with the places where energy is coming from. So it's from businesses saying, how do we do this? It's from urban designers, it's from educators, and it's from investors. Those are the four communities that are coming to me. I want to get great examples and say, here are some like you who are already doing this. Here are five steps you could take, questions you can ask, movements you can put in your own practice so that it just goes out and has a life of it, uh, its own and spreads uh, organically because by people who actually want to take it up. We will get married. Wonderful. <laughs> See this as an intellectual wedding. Thanks so much, Kate. I think this is really inspiring. Thanks a lot. <laughs>